Let 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 me. Yeah, I think so. Let uh, we invite them. Okay. <laughs> oh, my name is fine. Title of the of the session. Can easily go. Okay. Mobile phones on silent mode? It's not even here. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. So, good afternoon and welcome to the session. So, uh, I'm Yosebi Masete, a medical doctor by training. I'm here representing Two Hearts. Um, and the Manisa Foundation, and also working at the government as a director of the Mozambique's Pharmacy Entity. So thank you very much for coming and joining this session. Um, I'm not alone, of course. Um, as you can see, I'm very well accompanied. So I'll be uh, sharing this session together with Dr. Rella. Uh, she's a medical doctor by training, Probably you should stand. They don't, they don't see you. Exactly. Thank you. So um, she's leading some projects from, from Gabon, uh, conducting also a PhD uh, in antimalaria. So one of the PI from Pan Africa project, I'm Russell Kantam. Uh, welcome. So uh, this session will be slightly different. Uh, 
because we will have a first part which will be listening our friend Professor Charles and then we'll move to a, a very intensive talk given by our colleagues that they are standing at the table. Then we'll have a moment for questions and answers. So thank you very much. I'll ask my colleague, Dr. Rela, to, to go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Exobio, for this nice work. And you are all welcome for this session. It's more. The program uh, is designed now in the way to attract your interest. Hopefully, we enjoy what we prepare. And now I will briefly describe what is Sindofo and Pam Africa project. So, Sindofo and Pam Africa project, but at EDCTP funded project, supporting the development of malaria treatment. <coughs> Pam Africa, Pam Africa Consortium take portfolio approach to develop the next generation of malaria treatment. The consortium consists of five Africa partners and four partners from Europe. Conduct, support, conduct to, together the three clinical trials on malaria while supporting the effort to build clinical capacity and train scientists in Africa. Clinical trials focus on the development of the new anti-malaria, again, paras, parasite-resistant drug strain the development of a new formulation of atemetelumefantrine for the children last five kilograms, and the development of new anti-malaria for the treatment of severe malaria. Bedside diet, the Pam Africa also have like an objective to develop the capacity, the human capacity, is addressed through the targeted workshop and the training of researchers in site partners. This includes master and PhD. So far, like several workshops are already conducted, including like GCP and GCLP training, grant and scientific writing. You also have site qualification management system the scientific research management, ethical trial, and so on. We also have like a master's study and also PhD study on this consortium. Regarding the um, Sindofo project, Sindofo have like a four partner Africa and seven partner from Europe. And this project started on January 2021. And the main objective is the project is to develop the new, the new combination of malaria treatment for the treatment of uncomplicated, uncomplicated plasmodium falciparum malaria. And also, Training is one of the objectives of this consortium. So, so far, they also conduct several workshops, and we can we have like an introduction to the clinical trial, grant, grant writing, grant writing and synergy with Pam Africa. They also conduct a leadership and management treatment. Training, they also have like a, how can I call the, the conduct in Lambarine, the project management and clinical research coordination. 
and as there is an, an overlap between the, the participant partnership and the research area in both projects, Pam Africa and Sindofo, now the approach is like to have like a, to mutualize the effort in the order to capitalize maximal, maximally in the investment and share the training opportunity across the research in both project from Africa and Sindofo. Now this is what I can say about the board project. Thank you, um, Dr. Rala. So uh, as, I, as I said before, this will be a very particular session. Uh, you'll be busy in the next few minutes with a, a video that will be running out. Uh, this will be centralized on the interview that we made to Professor Charles. So Professor Charles was uh, former director of EDCTP, well known by most of us. So um, we had the opportunity to, to have a discussion. Uh, then after the video, give a few minutes for questions and answers. In that video also we account with the participation of Helen so when it comes to the question and answers, normally I push to my colleagues. So Helen will be joining me for, for answers. Thank you for accepting that. So thank you very much. Uh, I will ask our colleague at the technical side to press the button for the, uh, for the video. Now let me quickly introduce the Professor Charles Mengom. Professor Charles Mengom was Professor Charles Mengom was formerly the, the executive director of EDCTP. He, he is a pediatrician by training. She is a pediatrician by training and had a medical PhD in molecular genetics. Her main interest is about the, the, the developing and sustaining capacity building and also the development of tools against poverty-related diseases. Now we are going to hear her talk in capacity building. We will have the video of Professor Shal. Yeah. It's a bit in one side where we didn't see what's going on. Mm -hmm. No, but you can see it. Be as per the set that we can do it. I don't see anyone there in the cabin, so. They're working on it. They're working on it. Okay, we'll try that. Yeah. Okay. Ask. Can you explain? Uh, maybe we will move to the next speaker and then we'll come back to the video afterward.
Okay, so we'll continue with the next speaker and then we'll come back to the video. Uh, please, we can introduce this one. Okay, okay. Now we are going to have a talk of the next speaker. The second speaker is Professor Gisela Mambongoma. Professor Gisela Mambongoma is the head of operation, clinical operation at the Centre de Recherche Médicale de Lambarine. He is also the group leader at Bernard Norsch Institute for Tropical Medicine. Professor Mambo Ngoma is a medical doctor by training. She completed a master in epidemiology at London School for Tropical Medicine. She has a PhD in immunology. She is a lead, he is a, he is a lead team of several <laughs> EDCP project including Pam Africa and Sindofo. His main interest is the development and implementation of drugs related to poverty diseases, including children, adult and pregnant women. So over the 15 minutes, we will hear her thought about what needs to be done to improve. Uh, you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rela, um, Mr. Mr. Chair, and uh, Madame Le Chair. Um, yeah, it's good to see all of you here. And uh, sorry for the technical issue. Uh, this happens, actually. And uh, I'm sure it will uh, work afterwards. Uh, I'm sure the message coming from uh, Professor Charles Mingon is uh, a very good one for all of us. Um, yeah, it is uh, really my privilege to be here and uh, to share with you, um, as it says here in the title, what it takes to enhance uh, equitable and sustainable research in Africa. And uh, I'm going to uh, show a case um, of uh, delivering an innovative uh, clinical trial. I guess it works with uh, going with this, yeah. Uh, these are facts. 15% um, of the world, uh, world's population is from Africa. It's not really reflected in the room here, but it's, I, I, I guess it's not the color of the skin that makes uh, someone being an African. Uh, Africa bears 25% uh, of globally significant uh, disease. This is a fact as well. Uh, but in terms of uh, production, only 2% of the world's research is coming from Africa. Then there are significant challenges, and these include uh, a dearth of well-trained and skilled researchers, resulting in poor supervision of high-degree scholars, a lack of crit uh, critical mass of researchers, even where pockets of excellence exist, weak or very limited progression pathways uh, for those in scientific careers, poor research infrastructure, including a lack of access, um, to uh, scholarly tool, uh, tools such as scientific literature. So in that context, there are these two uh, consortia that have been already uh, introduced, the Palm Africa and the Sindofo. Uh, just shortly, uh, within the Palm Africa, there is uh, an important work package which is actually led by uh, Dr. Zebi Machete and uh, Helen uh, Damares from, v uh, from MMV. And these are the objectives that are shown here of that work package. Uh, I can read uh, here that it is to support clinical trial sites participating in uh, work package one to work package three, including training to build and strengthen clinical research capacities and infrastructure at key selected sites across Africa. So there are targeted workshops and long-term training uh, aligned with GCP guidelines and so, uh, and so on. Uh, here I quickly uh, show uh, of course, some of the outputs and outcomes uh, from uh, that capacity building. Uh, we do have uh, younger uh, colleagues who are involved in PhDs uh, and masters. And here you can see for the masters, uh, there is a master in uh, epidemiology with a focus on biostatistics at the University of uh, Witwa uh, Waters, Waters Rand in South Africa. And uh, uh, these are the colleagues here who are have been registered for some, and some are still completing their masters there. I won't go through the details, uh, but this is all available in the website of Pharma Africa. 
And uh, here, of course, there is a university in South Africa, uh, but uh, as well, some of the colleagues are being trained at the Makerere uni uh, University uh, in that program, the colleagues from Uganda. I think this is as well good in terms of capacity building then because this is uh, not only the training of these fellows, but as well, it is bringing something to these universities uh, being involved. In terms of PhD candidates, that's the same. We do have here the candidates that are listed. Um, uh, Victor coming from Uganda, uh, Nahum coming, uh, coming from Burkina Faso, uh, Francis coming from Burkina Faso as well, because we do have two sites in Burkina Faso, uh, Emma Gladys coming from Gabon, and uh, Abel coming from uh, um, Mozambique. Uh, most of them are registered at the University of Tübingen in Germany. Uh, Abel is registered at the University of Barcelona in Spain. And then there are all the courses that are made within this uh, consortium, and the courses are listed here. I can quickly read some of them. Uh, there are GCP, GCLP, um, GCAP, GCP again, and uh, quality uh, management system. I can tell you that uh, myself, I took part to some of these uh, trainings and uh, they were of uh, very good quality and uh, yeah, uh, I have to say that they, they built my own uh, capacity and then I'm sure that the younger colleagues uh, benefited a lot. So next to that there is the Sindo4 project which uh, is, uh, uh, has as well a strong uh, capacity building um, aspect. Then this is led by Sir Mel, uh, myself with uh, Kike Basat from uh, East Global, and the objectives listed here to provide support, the same as it was with Palm Africa, with the training uh, staff, and uh, of course PhD and postdocs. And uh, at the moment, outputs and outcomes, uh, we do have uh, the colleagues. Uh, here in this slide, something that uh, I would like to um, stress on is that uh, the, the four colleagues that you see here, three are PIs and uh, among the PIs, we do have two ladies, the two young ladies that are sitting here that will be talking uh, some, some time after me. And um, there are three ladies on this slide. This is as well to show how in um, building the capacity we are empowering as well uh, women, uh, particularly coming from Africa. And uh, again, there have been uh, some uh, courses that were provided within the Sindo4 and um, these are the courses, leadership and management training, introduction to clinical trials, uh, some online uh, courses on grant writing, uh, project management, and GCP uh, training. These were the courses delivered during the, uh, the, the period from 20 to, uh, 20, 2020 to 2023, and still the, there is a, uh, another program coming for the year 2024 until the end of the pro program. Yeah, it is one of the pictures of a training that was done in Lambarine, Gabon, and that was the training on uh, an introduction to uh, clinical trials. Very good feedback from the people who took part to that training, and it is a training that will go on then for all the uh, other sites in Africa involved. Next to the training short courses, within the, uh, all the consortia, there is actually a, an aspect with uh, infrastructure upgrades. This goes with uh, basic equipment for the trials. Um, of course, vehicles, this is very important for the logistics, having the vehicles to transport the participants, but as well the, the site staff. Um, site refurbishment, this is applicable for, for CML, but it is as well the same uh, for all the other sites uh, involved in Burkina Faso, so that the same uh, equipment, biochemistry and so on. Uh, upgrade of data management facilities. This is uh, a specific point on data management uh, facilities because then I will be showing what is what we call the innovation in delivering uh, clinical trials because there will be some roles that will be attributed to the different sites. And in Mozambique, that the same improvement of facilities at the Manisa District Hospital. Some images of, uh, yeah, this is uh, the lab of uh, CERMEL that's uh, uh, the different projects, we are actually mutualizing the resources from Palm Africa, from Sindo4, but from other projects funded by EDCTP, but as well the good link that we do have with the German government. Uh, a lot of these resources uh, have allowed us to have these uh, working space that you can see here, which uh, 
uh, if one doesn't tell you, you can believe that you are in settings like it would be in Europe, but this is in Gabon. My last point, and a very important one, is uh, the, uh, something innovative that uh, uh, when we conduct clinical trials, we need CROs uh, most of the time, like to deliver some se services. The vendors that will be giving, uh, maybe doing the data management, uh, doing the quality control, and so on. In Sindofo, uh, um, uh, um, we've uh, developed something. Normally, uh, the sponsor is now uh, Zydus, which is uh, an Indian uh, company, pharmaceutical company. Uh, and that company is develop, de developing the ZY19489 uh, compound, uh, along with the uh, ferroquine. And um, with the role that they could play, it was limited. And uh, with the grant that we have, we thought, OK, we're going to reduce the cost. But by reducing the cost, give more possibilities to the African sites. And uh, the African sites, of course, they are recruiting the participants. But we don't limit the, uh, them to uh, that role of uh, recruiting the participants. Then they can. Uh, be more uh, active, uh, even a site, imagine a site who uh, will not be recruiting participants can still contribute uh, in that project in doing uh, a, a specific role. So some of the roles that were identified are listed here. Um, I take the example of the Strathmore University uh, informed consent, like uh, in the different trials that we do. So the Strathmore University is delivering uh, developing the informed consent. Something that we've been discussing during the last days is then like we will have to assess at some point the difference between a sponsor deliver, uh, 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 designed informed consent and the kind of site specific designed uh, informed consent because sometimes uh, we've been complaining with the length of informed consent when it comes from the pharmaceutical companies. So yeah, this is something that we can say is as well innovative and we will assess at some point uh, whether it changes uh, the consideration as well at the ethic, uh, ethics committees. Uh, of course, there are responsibilities that still uh, go to Zydus, the Indian company. Um, to the site, we will see, okay, submission, this is mostly done by the sites. But something important here is, let's say the uh, pharmacodynamic sample analysis that will be centralized. So CML will act as a central laboratory, so receiving all the samples for molecular biology from all the sites in Africa, Burkina Faso, Kenya, Mozambique, they will be centralized in, uh, at CML. So this will be a new capacity, and then CML can claim after that project for future projects that, yeah, it is something that they've been doing already, and they can certainly do. Why not maybe pharmaceutical companies like uh, Novartis, once they could, of course, they've been working already with lab corps and so on, but maybe they could as well uh, take CML on board. I'm just say, uh, saying for CML, but that's, a, uh, that's valid for any other. That the same for the slide reading. This is actually centralized at uh, SISM in Mozambique. And the last thing is the data management that is uh, uh, centralized in uh, Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso will be doing, uh, developing the, the, the database, uh, providing the data management training, and following all, uh, getting the data, and at the end, uh, organizing the data analysis. We believe that this is a really innovative, and these are new roles that will be given to African sites, and so that uh, research centers will develop uh, other capacities, not only uh, recruiting uh, participants. And uh, the few slides that I'm showing now are, of course, the, 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 the capacities that we've been uh, building. Uh, of course, it was already there, we've upgraded. Uh, here we see the molecular lab uh, at CML, uh, still the molecular lab at CML that will serve for that project. Again, the molecular lab. And uh, yeah, uh, here we do have the space uh, in Burkina Faso where we do the data management. Uh, Burkina Faso will be already supporting the first part of the project, which is the Zypher 1, that we aim to start during the first trimester of the next year. Again, Burkina Faso, some IT development improvement, and so on. Um, I finish with this slide by reading this. These are words that I actually took from um, um, a previous slide that was supposed to be presented by Professor Charles Mingon. 
Um, the ADCT capacity development model, capacity building should be comprehensive and holistic to allow local ownership and full and equitable participation from the South. It should be accompanied by the support of an enabling environment, including robust ethics review and regulatory framework and the required infrastructures. It should strengthen local institutions and research leadership to successfully carry out and plan research using best practice and international standards. I believe that this is what we've been doing within Palm Africa and Sindofo. With this, I say thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Sislan, to sharing with us how is your vision to build capacity in the research center in Africa. Now, if it is ready, we will have see this video. I don't know if someone check. Professor okay. Charles, uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, I've got a couple of questions for you, and I'm fascinated to hear your replies. So you have been with EDCTP uh, since its very inception. Um, you led the African office. You were executive director for nearly a decade. Um, could you tell us why EDCTP1 was so necessary to the research community at that time? And what was it like practicing before EDCTP1? What chief issues was it set up to solve at the time? Yeah, Helen, uh, EDCTP was uh, established specifically to make sure that uh, North-South research is done in an equitable manner. Prior to the advent of the EDCTP, very often uh, experts, uh, scientists from the North used to come to Africa to do research and go. Uh, what we then called parachutist uh, researchers. Uh, practical individuals will come, collect samples, live with the samples and go to analyze in, in the north uh, and write up papers in the north. Then came EDCTP with the idea that, no, this is not right. I mean, if we're going to have a north-south research, it should be done in equal partnerships. Uh, but equal partnerships, of course, was very difficult because uh, the northern partners were more equipped in terms of uh, capacity, in terms of funding, uh, and quite often will we'll have an idea, I want to do this, and then come to South, find a partner uh, who is really a recipient rather than uh, 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 an equal uh, 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 participant in the research. So this is what, this, that was one of the things that uh, EDCTP, right from the beginning, uh, beginning set out to correct. Uh, that uh, the partnership should be generally equal, uh, which means uh, the southern partner should have the same capacity uh, as the northern partner. Uh, when it comes to do a collaborative work, they should be involved right from the beginning in designing the research project, in uh, doing the research project, in analysis, and the final publication. But all along, uh, also, they're the ones who know where are the areas that require, what are the priority areas that require research uh, uh, since they know the disease burden of Africa more than the northern partners? Thank you, Prof. Eusebio. Yes, uh, thank you, Helen. Professor Charles, this is always a pleasure to talk with you. And going to the, uh, to the discussion today, uh, I mean, the EDCP has been a long way life of investigators and partnership uh, from the North, Africa, for us as a researcher at that time, I mean, the curiosity was always around what could be the principle that could be guiding the EDCP to go through all these challenges. Second, what could be the perception from the funders, specifically for the North, as you mentioned, to investing in research and specifically research in Africa? Because, you know, the, 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 the investment in, in, in research is investing in development. So, do they think that they are really investing to develop African science? Yeah, that's a problem because, I mean, uh, it, people finding research wanted value for money. And the quickest way of doing that is to go for efficiency, to go for excellence. In the past, what used to happen is that, uh, okay, a center like yours, Manisa, which was very good, 
was the one that will receive funding because they are likely to be able to do the work correctly and uh, properly to get good results. Uh, in other words, uh, even if an area where there is disease but there is poor capacity, no research will take place there. Uh, in other words, as I said earlier on, capacity building was not thought to be cost effective. It was not uh, cost, uh, thought to be sexy, the right thing to do. So that's, that's, that is one of the problems. That, uh, and to go to the other extreme, even uh, the ethics and regulatory environment, where it was poor, weak, or non-existent, uh, funders wouldn't go to do research there. Uh, they will want to go to, to do research where they can be sure that the ethics committee will be uh, uh, able to, to, to do the oversight. And unfortunately, this was the case in many parts of Africa. There was only, not only poor regulatory and uh, ethics committee, but poor infrastructure, as well as uh, uh, ill-equipped uh, uh, scientists themselves. So this is the problem, that uh, funding used to go to where there is always uh, uh, good uh, uh, infrastructure, and where there was poor infrastructure, nothing was done. Yeah, Helen, you want to go ahead, please. Um, yeah, actually, that that's a really important uh, and interesting point, because the <clears throat> EDCTP2, um, that has supported both the com Pam Africa Consortium and the Sindofo has built in uh, capacity development for the research centres and for the emerging scientists who are associated with those research centres to be able to uh, deliver the clinical trials that are, are within those particular um, grants. So it's an amazing opportunity, as you say, to not just straight away automatically give the funding um, to a centre that's already equipped and able to do it. Um, it's, it allows um, more infrastructure to be built, more training to take place. Um, if you take, for example, uh, the Pam Africa Consortium, there are three different clinical trials within that. Um, and we have uh, five different African partners, all of whom are benefiting from um, uh, research um, capability strengthening through PhDs, uh, through MSCs. Um, we have some workshop style uh, trainings that are taking place uh, both online and face to face. So the idea is that um, after the consortium trials are finished, that there will be, um, I guess, a legacy of uh, highly trained individuals to be able to uh, attract and benefit uh, from further research going forwards. Um, so that's uh, something that we'll hear a bit more about later on in this, uh, this session today. Um, but I just wanted to make the mm. point that uh, these... Um, these initiatives are underway um, to focus on on the infrastructure and the training of individuals and, and whole teams. Mm -hmm. Excellent, Helen. In fact, you've reminded me this, the whole concept of EDCTP is that uh, when that research is done and uh, the results are out, uh, that capacity which is being built, uh, hopefully to be able to not only uh, uh, analyze, but also make sure that uh, the if there's any policy changes, there are people who are capable, there is a leadership which are capable of uh, uh, taking them to, to the next stage, to implement them uh, to the access level. And not only that, uh, when the research is finished, the capacity left behind is able to plan for new research. And uh, quite often, that, uh, uh, and we saw this example, for instance, during Ebola and COVID outbreaks. Although the aim of EDCTP was to strengthen uh, capacity against HIV, TB, and malaria, but that capacity, I mean, I somebody who was trained in immunology, somebody who was trained in microbiology or, or statistics and data management, will be able to carry out other research uh, for their country. Uh, 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 it was very evident during Ebola and uh, uh, COVID that there were strong uh, research base uh, a, a, a group of scientists who were able to adapt and do uh, carry out activities. And similarly to the other endemic diseases like chronic diarrhea diseases, uh, diarrhea diseases like uh, 
uh, outbreaks of uh, 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 other diseases besides the traditional diseases supported by EDCDP, those individuals will be able to do that in their country. And I think that is the most important. And of course, sustainability. If you've got a, 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 a group of individuals who are working together, uh, uh, you, you leave a base which can, uh, by, 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 it, it is some sort of a, a critical mass of uh, scientists working uh, on uh, their own problems. Uh, which reminds me another thing that uh, the, 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 what EDCDP has been doing right from the beginning is to foster South-South partnerships. So, for instance, like in the, in the, in the uh, uh, Palm Africa and Rofa uh, uh, consortium, there are individuals working together from different countries in Africa, uh, working together also with industry, which is another issue which EDCDP had emphasized on. So when you have this strong uh, uh, network of scientists working together, it gives some sort of uh, sustainability as well as proliferation of their uh, uh, capacity to other parts of the, the continent. So, Professor Charles, um, um, going back to the, this relationship between North and South, uh, mm -hmm. and you described it very well, of course there should be some changes in the, in the behavior of the fund, funders and how, how do you describe through all this time? Because we can see it in the field. Um, Professor Charlie, you remember that in the beginning, um, uh, most of the coordinators of the recipient, I mean, as the coordinators of the projects, they were based in the North. And then slightly we start having the, uh, the, the African coordinating some project. We start having some PhDs leading some of the uh, 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 projects. Uh, depending on the area of, of knowledge. So it means that at some point, the funders also, they, they incorporate on their procedures all these change, historical change. So how do you describe this? Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, the, 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 the bottom line there is capacity. In the past, uh, quite often, uh, uh, our fellow scientists from the South used to wait, uh, the idea, as I said earlier on, the ideas will come from the north, the funding will come from the north, and you're taken as a partner to join in the, in, in the collaboration. And not only as a partner, but as a junior partner, I must emphasize. Uh, uh, but once we, be, we, we the, the capacity, then the Eusebius like you be, became into, in, in, into, the, into, into the play, they could come up with their own ideas, and uh, it, it, things started changing. And I said before, uh, in earlier talks, uh, in this paradigm shift, uh, uh, people started also thinking of uh, changing the center of the gravity to the south or switching the poles, whereby an individual in the south who knows the problem much better than their fellow uh, uh, scientists in the north came with ideas themselves, okay, this is where we should go, this is what we should do. And this is changing now very often that uh, but all this uh, uh, comes from trust, uh, and I believe uh, the most the underlying thing there really is uh, a strong research capacity and self belief. Now we have scientists like yourself who are believing. I mean, who even in the world they, they represent uh, uh, in very, very important committees, uh, and they have ideas just like their northern partners. But now they have a voice and they can be heard, and that's why things are changing. No, thanks. And sorry, Helen, I'll give you the phone. So in that line, um, the gender comes on board. And as Professor Charles, you know that in Africa, gender issues are very complex. When you come to ground, ladies and young uh, students have to go to the farm when they start raining to accompany the parents to, to help them to, 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 to produce food. Uh, and, and these reduce the proportion of ladies who continue in the, in, the, in, the, in the school. But when we come to the top, we want to see the ladies leading in an equal proportion as, as, as male. So how this gender issue was, was uh, taken uh, within the EDCP, how it should be improved, where are the bottlenecks? Yeah. First of all, we must remember this is not uh, confined to the African setting or the low in, uh, and middle income countries only. Even in the North, frankly speaking, uh, 
if you look at the scientists, the higher you go uh, in, the, in the hierarchy, the more male dominance you see. So this is a, a general problem. But of course, this is more acute in Africa because of some of the reasons we mentioned, uh, uh, male preference in parenthood, male preference in uh, the way the governments and the people work. Uh, but I'm happy to say that EDCTP, right from the beginning, had applied a gender lens throughout. For instance, some of the, the KPI, some of the indicators which we normally access is how many publications are done for, by uh, a female sex, how many yep. uh, scientists, uh, how many research projects are led by, by the female gender, and so forth. So, and I think this is where we should continue working on. And uh, if I have to plead to uh, the community, uh, the scientific community, the, uh, the, the science leaders in the South, this is what they should uh, keep on preaching all the time because our governments always need to remind it. Uh, we should keep on talking about this. Uh, and this stems from right from the beginning uh, in terms of uh, science education. Uh, there should be a, a, a proactive uh, uh, recruiting of uh, uh, girls in science subjects, the, the so-called STEM subjects. And uh, this is happening already in some parts of Africa, but I would like it, this to be really uh, uh, taken more seriously. And uh, it is upon us, uh, research scientists uh, in the South, uh, to, to, to advocate for this. Thank you, Hello, Pastor. <laughs> yeah, something very close to my heart, obviously, uh, as a as a female scientist myself. But we're actually very lucky. Uh, later in this symposium, we're going to hear from um, two female African scientists um, who are stepping into leadership positions. So um, it will be very interesting indeed to hear about their journey and the the challenges and the support that uh, they've received along their way. So we'll come back to them later, but um, Prof, I want to make the most of our time with you this morning. And I, I want you to imagine just for a moment that we're in, let's say 2030, the year 2030. What would your vision be? How, how would you like to see research capacity changed within Africa um, in terms of uh, leadership, uh, equitable partnerships, strength and capacity? If you could give us just a few thoughts of your, your vision for where we'll be then. My vision is to see that uh, the capacity for research is largely developed by the African authorities and African governments ourselves, because this capacity belongs to us. So it is from within that uh, we should uh, ensure that uh, uh, we fund the capacity. We invest on the capacity. And uh, uh, this way we also can direct where the investment needs to go. These three, there are three areas where I know we are extremely deficient. One, in investment on the leadership, female leadership in science. And this is one area where uh, our authorities should pay extra attention in the teaching of the stem cells uh, for the child girl and in uh, encouraging uh, 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 women to go into science and science leadership. The other two areas are uh, the earlier part uh, uh, in the R&D chain, which is the uh, discovery. Uh, at the moment, most of the uh, 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 products that are being trialed in Africa are coming from Europe or America. So if we can invest on upstream research and uh, uh, infrastructure, that will be wonderful. And lastly, on downstream, uh, we need to start manufacturing our own vaccines our own drugs, and if we can uh, achieve these three things by 2030, I'll be the happiest person alive. Thank you. Wise words. <laughs> yeah, has to be driven from within as well yes. as uh, from without. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's that's very thought provoking. Um, Asebio, do, do you want to add anything into the mm. conversation? Yeah. Um, Professor Charles, do you think that your generation was much committed to the research than the young people, um, meaning our, our generation or the generation that they're coming. Because you, when you see how, I mean, this is a probably very, very close thinking, 
Um, uh, but there's a trend of people to, when we, we, we had junior people working with us, we are by, by, you know, instinct we used to push them and, to, and think that they are not much committed, uh, comparing with the, with other generation and so on. And this is a trend which sometimes we minimize, we tend to minimize the effort that, uh, used to be made by young generation on, on science. And second, looking back, what, which, which issue do you think that should be considered in order to make this um, way, new way to approach science as EDCP has done uh, to be sustainable, to be uh, equitable, and uh, with all these challenges, even considering gender, regions, and so on, Develop, level of development of the countries because you, you cannot compare Kenya, I'm sorry, you cannot compare Mozambique probably with Ghana in terms of science. You cannot compare probably uh, Kenya with Mozambique. There's some differences even across African countries. So what what probably scientific community in Africa expect is that at some point all these differences could be stable. Of course, there will be some some levels of uh, improving and so on. But which aspect do you think that should be considered in advance in order in the near future, uh, this stability and sustainability could be achieved uh, in partnership between Europe and Africa and other region of the globe? Mm -hmm. I don't know, I mean, that's a very uh, uh, loaded question, Eusebio. First of all, about the different generation, every generation will presume that oh, our generation was much better than yours. You, <laughs> but uh, you are putting me in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a fix here. If that is the case, then there's something wrong with our generation. We did not uh, 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 send out uh, good genes or good vibes to make sure that there is sustainability and continuum. No, but I believe actually. Yeah. Uh, the, the current generation is much better because they are more equipped. I mean, uh, we've got better infrastructure, we've got uh, uh, better uh, networking and so forth. So they should be better than the previous generation for sure. Uh, but the question about dedication and all that is upon us now, the senior people who are going away to ensure that uh, uh, those we are leaving behind, uh, they have the same, because when sometimes you have things easier, you become lazy, but I hope this is not going to be the case. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like I, if, if your father had a farm and he left you a farm, you should do much better as a farmer than when there was no land at all. So it, it should be the other way around. Mm. Yeah. As to the question of uh, 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 African involvement, also there should be a political will. There have been a few uh, 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 coming from here and there about having a, a general fund for research in Africa and so forth, uh, or even national funds. Uh, I've mentioned in the slides there that, uh, among other things, so I should start, start now uh, advocating strongly for research councils in Africa. So that, I mean, uh, we fund our research, we, we fund it, uh, capacity development, uh, we build up the agenda for the research and so forth. I think this, this is already happening. Uh, uh, we have some uh, also even uh, North-South cooperation in forming these uh, uh, research councils. But uh, as, as I said before, this, the cry should come from within. It is from Africa that uh, we should come up with uh, 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 the way forward for this. Yeah. Mm. Helen, you want to come in? Uh... I honestly don't think we can top what uh, prof has just said there <laughs> it has to come from within i think those are very good um closing thoughts uh to to finish with and allow us to uh to move on and hear from uh, some other colleagues involved with pam africa and sindofo on uh, their experiences of capacity development thank you professor charles thank you very much Ellen. thank you very much Okay, finally it works, <laughs> at least. So thank you very much for using your time to listen to this video. Uh, now we're going to prepare two of our colleagues that will be talking, uh, representing also the gender uh, equity that is uh, always in place within the Pan-African and Sindofo. 
But before that, I will give the floor uh, for questions, uh, uh, comments. Helen, you join us for just to maximize the time. Okay, okay. Okay, so allow me to introduce my colleagues. Um, we have a two very powerful colleagues coming for the, our projects that we'll be talking today. Uh, they are Didei uh, Oku from Sermel, Gabon, and then we have a Jessica from Mozambique. Both of them, they're still under training within our project. Uh, Didei is more focused on the uh, probably diseases related and infection diseases. Uh, she had a bachelor from Nigeria now and then graduated in microbiology. Um, after that, she went to Bulgaria to have their master in medicine and surgery. So she's now at Sermel um, involved in the in this wonderful project. Then we have our colleague Jessica, based in Manisa, Mozambique. She's a medical doctor by training, mostly dedicating time to the neonatology, uh, also involved in our project, in this case in Sintofu. So they are going to uh, give the case in a very interactive way. So I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Ezebio, for the kind introduction. So when I was a child, uh, I saw my sister going to school every day. And I was very sad not to go with her. So one day, I decided to starve on myself and not eat until my parents took me to school. I was very young. I was only five years old. And that's when it all started. The teachers told us to write essays about what we wanted to be in the future. And my dream was to hold a heart. Uh, during our childhood, we always heard our parents and people who loved us say, you are in our heart. And I thought, what would that heart be like? Uh, it's probably something we'll have to take very good care of. That's how my passion for medicine was born, being a doctor and taking care of people. I did medicine and afterwards a master's, in, a master's degree in cardiovascular pathophysiology. And now I am a PhD student at the University of Barcelona and PI of the Sindofo project. So how did I become a PI? I was good at sciences. There was no big story behind it. I picked sciences because I excelled at it. After finishing my bachelor's, I had the option of doing a master's or medicine. A master's degree would bring me closer to my planned goal, and it seemed easier, so I opted for something more difficult. I wanted to do something that wasn't done in my family or immediate community. I wanted to be the first doctor in my community and make my parents proud. So I did this for six years. Sorry. So I did this for six years, after which I realized I had done it for everyone else, my parents, my community. Don't get me wrong. There is nothing wrong with living your life in service to others. I was going to specialize in cardiology, but first I wanted to try research for a year. Well, a year became four years. I loved it so much. I started doing it for me. I love the versatility in research that you never really know everything and you're always learning. Yes, this is the case also for medicine, but I thought with research it was more challenging for me. In research, I was fulfilling so many roles. I get to be a physician, a community advocate, a coordinator, a student, a teacher, a pharmacist, a quality assurance personnel, and best of all, a traveler. I get to combine all the best things, all the best parts of the things I love to do, and I do it daily. Now you know a bit about us and how we got to be here. It may seem pretty straightforward, but we had to overcome some challenges and we had to, some hurdles to get over. After talking, we decided to highlight the biggest challenges we had to overcome. So we had the organizational, cultural, and institutional policies and practices. There's the le leaky pipeline effect that was described in UNESCO in 2019. We have 53% of female 
females who did their bachelor's <laughs> proceeded to do their master's. Out of this 53%, only 43 of them did PhD. And out of the 43% of female PhD graduates, only 28 of them, 28% of them, went further into um, female research as female researchers. Why would this be the case? Could it be because of discriminatory recruitment biases or because they decided to do something different other than research? Jessica, what other challenges? So like Derry said, it may sound perfect, but there were certain challenges. We live in a society where women are raised to be homemakers and thus they play a central role in their families as a wife and or as a mother. The responsibility to take care and cater for the needs of the immediate and extended family, the children, husband, and elderly is time consuming and leaves little time to address research career advancement needs, including multiple opportunities for travel and collaborations, networking, and capacity building. The perception of professional and personal success means that women have to do more to prove themselves that they are capable of and are consistently required to show commitment and professionalism because their work patterns do not conform to the academic research culture prescribed by men. And unfortunately, from women who occupy leadership positions but who don't feel maternal towards other women. So in order for women to effectively progress in research, they had to come up with resilient strategies. Some opt to work at night after finishing their household chores. Others work at their own pace, which often lead to delaying career progression when, when, when compared with their male colleagues. Some women chose polygamous homes to share responsibilities, to share responsibility with other female in the family front so they could focus on research. The summary of this uh, resilient strategy was centered in sacrifice. So these challenges are not just common with us. We spoke with colleagues, with friends who are in research, and these are their stories. Some of them <laughs> reported they, that they had to choose between raising family and having children uh, because the maternity leave would require a break from research career, and this would hinder their progression. Others reported that not being married or having children was the same as not holding leadership positions because it didn't convey enough maturity. So only 31.2% of the world researchers are women. While we are aware, why we are aware that things are changing and taking it on for a better, but this is happening slowly. In 1996, less data was reported and the gender parity was between 44 to 55%. Since then, it has improved. More countries are reporting. We had more data from 170 countries concerning this. In sub-Saharan Africa, the amount of women in research, according to UNESCO, accounts for 31.3%. In 2021, data from Europe shows that the average percentage of professors, women professors are 26%, and the percentage of women who graduated with their PhD was 48%. In leadership roles, we even have less representation. There are less women. However, there has been steady increase from 33.3% in 2016 to 36.9% in 2022, according to Global Gender Gap Report. So we have shared our challenges, and we thought it would be nice to offer some solutions, which we believe will make things better. So these are the things I wish I had known. Things I wish I had known before I started my career. We would like to be part of those who made things easier for those who come after us. When I started research, I didn't know what I didn't even know. So I had to read everything in my path. Yes, no knowledge is a waste, but it would have been more effective to have a guideline. An idea would be to create a readily available curriculum for people new in research on what courses to do and what is the optimum time to go through these courses. Perhaps this already exists. 
and I am unaware of it. But if I had it when I started, it would have made things effective. To create a platform for women in science for shared experiences. While it is wise to learn everything by experience, it is wiser to learn from others' experiences. It is not, there is not enough time to learn everything in life by trial and error. So a platform for women in science to share their real life experiences, their lessons learned, and the tools they use to cope would be very useful for the younger next generation. Thirdly, an open mentorship program. Empowered people should empower others. There should be mentorship programs that provide young female researchers with role models who would help them navigate their careers. A study showed that women exposed to female role models had increased positive attitude, self-efficiency, and a deeper connection to their discipline of choice. Lastly, mental health care. There are different support systems in place to help working moms in the North, but not so much in the South. There should be provision of crutch in research institutions, longer maternity and paternity leave, lactation rooms for new mothers. Recently, Jessica and I went to Strathmore Business School and we were very happy to find out that they had lactation rooms because we had discussed how she had to go to a bathroom every time she needed to pump. So we need some days for home office and some free therapy session. Mental health is not something that is often talked about in Africa community. Meanwhile, the African Women Developmental Fund reported 73 million African women are affected with mental health conditions. In 2022, WHO reported more than 116 million people worldwide are estimated to be living with mental health conditions. And this is even before the pandemic. So what's next? Uh, what can be improved? Like Professor Schultz said, female leadership in science, improve female leadership in science, upstream research and infrastructure, and local manufacturing of medicines and vaccines. So, think, so this can lead to more and equal job opportunities to female researchers. Things are changing. As we can saw yesterday, Professor Kogi Naido won an outstanding female scientist prize. This is inspiring to us, and we believe other female researchers would see this win. As we can see, these are daughters, sisters, mothers, wives, and beside all of that, female researchers. Like Ferguson Sterry says, that acknowledges that woman's career advancement in any organization is influenced by societal and systematic factors, and that cultural and social attitudes toward gender responsibilities influences perceptions of job roles and responsibilities. I personally found that I would, I would be a mother in the start of my career, my research career, and I felt and feel that things are really changing. I had and have the support of my bosses, who are males, my colleagues, and my family. And this encouraged me to stay steady in my course. We cannot fail to acknowledge how far we have come. However, with the call of ge for gender balance also brings the importance for providing the right training that puts into context the role of a woman in her home and community, not just her workplace. We are grateful for the opportunities accorded to us and our current roles as Sindofo, in Sindofo as PIs. We have been able to take part in several trainings under Pam Africa and Sindofo. And we believe with our qualification, our experience, and our continuous training, we are being prepared. We are ready to be closer to the decision table. And we hope by the next forum, more young female researchers will be present and a more laid out plan to get here will be available. So we leave you with this. There is no single approach to success. Find one that works for you and enjoy it. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Duery. Thank you, Jessica, yeah. for sharing. <laughs> your experience as a woman in research, um, chasing your dream and overcoming barriers. 
And also thank you to Roman us that the things are changing, but you still need to accelerate this change. As of you, you have the, the floor is to you. Thank you very much. This was uh, personally, if I was under emotion. So uh, thank you very much for the, for the presentation. So we had the Professor Charles, and then we had these two talks, uh, including Professor Celine Ngome. So please, uh, this is a moment for question, comments. We have to change things. Uh, we have been listening, our colleagues saying that um, it has to change. It has been, it has been improving, but we still uh, room to change. Please, go ahead. Question. I'm, I'm not sure whether Mark is. Amazing women leaders. My name is Ethel Makila from IRV. And um, the issue of women leadership in science is something that, yes, it is changing. And I'll just give an example from something that, an initiative that is happening in Nayavi, which I have the privilege to be leading. Nayavi, in its research, has a leadership development program that looks at overall leadership development for science generally. But then I looked at there are some nuances for women in leadership that may not necessarily be addressed in the normal program. And you touched on some of them. <laughs> Learning from each other and support, psychosocial, cultural support. And so in a small way, um, we are working with the women within, our, within the network. We have around 10 organizations that are in HIV vaccine research. And just looking at what else can be done. Talks on mental health, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Talks on personal branding as a woman leader. Talks on negotiating how to manage office or work politics. And I think this is something that really needs support. It needs funding. And I'm open to conversation. Meet me at my poster 407 tomorrow. We'll talk about it more. Anyone can join me, and we can see what more we can do. This is just a small start, but we can do so much more. Thank you for the comment. They will follow you. Next question, please. Yeah, th thank you very much. Thanks to the presenters for the exciting and also the emotional presentations, particularly from the two ladies. So I have this uh, particular comment that I will always want to make, particularly when it comes to manufacturing in Africa. I think uh, there is a lot of drive uh, towards getting this done, but I think uh, most of the time efforts or discussions or debates are being tailored towards complex things like vaccines and also uh, drugs, which are very uh, difficult to manufacture. I don't know why we don't think about uh, simple things like medical consumables and even things like syringe, uh, syringe safety boxes and also things like plasters and other consumables that are imported uh, from uh, other countries like India and China. So they're actually like very simple things that we can manufacture, we can set up manufacturing lines and we can develop the capacity, build the necessary regulatory capacity before passing on to complex things like, uh, uh, like uh, biologics and also drugs. So I don't know why the debate is not tilted towards that way, why, they wa why we want to focus on the difficult things that are that even uh, developing countries, even developed countries have tried and many have uh, failed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, point rise, please. Merci, patron Isobio. So now just a question, thank you, and the congratulations to Davis and then Collins for this nice uh, section. My question is uh, regarding, yeah, the capacity develop development is only at a very earlier career stage, master's and the PhD. I'm wondering why you, can, you, you can't go beyond that. Uh, you have people maybe to go more than that. It's too, for me, it's something known already, and all capacity building, as you know very well, is obvious. It's only master, PhD, master, PhD. We, should, we could change the paradigm a bit to make it to the high level, also to have very high standing female. If you want to, if the call is for female, of course, I believe not, maybe to go beyond this uh, uh, basic capacity, which is kind of uh, generic. That's uh, if you still have time to change it, to, to create a high level uh, capacity, mm -hmm. it will be interesting. 
Thank you for the, for the comment. This has been, yesterday we had an opportunity to listen to Professor Peter Kremsner. Um, uh, this has been a discussion even within the DCP for many years, uh, how to launch the professor fellowship. Uh, finally, we had a, at least one example that it's possible. It takes time, but it's doable. So congratulations, probably we will follow that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. That is a really interesting point, that last uh, thing that was raised there. Um, I would just say that for, for me uh, personally, but also within the, um, the these two grant consortium, we, we also have the workshop type training that was <clears throat> specifically designed to be able to reach a wider team than, say, just our PhD students and our MSCs. So that, you know, science is bigger than the leaders, it's, it involves everybody. And I think um, courses such as, um, well, the, the management and leadership training that I know happened recently, um, scientific writing courses, the, these are geared at a wider demographic. Uh, and that, I hope, helps to bring a bit more sustainability to career progression as well as just getting the academic qualifications. But I, I hear you, and it's very important that those um, career pathways are available for people, um, perhaps wider than <clears throat> in the clinic and in the lab, but across the whole ecosystem of science to support um, the whole research inf infrastructure and, and science in Africa. Thank you, good question. So before we, there won't be any other hands, so, okay, please then. Yeah, just a little, uh, just a little comment. Um, I would like to call upon all the uh, slightly older people uh, than the rest of us uh, here, all the leaders, to also consider making some uh, space for the female uh, leaders of the future. So maybe we should consider stepping back at an earlier age. <laughs> okay. So, um, any, any other hands? Again, Veronica in love from the University of Yemen, the one, a Canton partner. Uh, raising gender issue as something that uh, really should be very important is by EDCTP, I think it's, it's really real. Uh, when you consider our African context. Huh? Uh, so I want to thank EDCTP and all the partners for Canton, UKT, CML, and so on, who worked every day so that gender should be taken into account, should be strengthened uh, during our training, capacity, and so on, to make them be more strengthened, more capacitated uh, through their PhD program and so on is really, uh, is really grateful and I really appreciate. But uh, I think we still have more to do. I thank this people all have been doing already, but I think we still have maybe to make sure that maybe some of the funders who are around maybe address their calls and put gender in the center of this call. I don't know how they are going to do that, but uh, maybe creating some calls specifically for gender. Why not price? Give price for scientists, gender, female scientists, who are in the different countries who have, really, uh, have been really uh, performing uh, very good in their research and so on. That is very, is very important also. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the, for the comments. So I think we, okay, we have one hand here and another one. So we, just women are talking. I don't know if it's <laughs> okay. Bernard, probably you. you come up representing us. So. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. I'm Pauline Biachika. I'm from Makere University in Uganda. I'm a professor of internal medicine. I what I wanted to add is I appreciate all the challenges. They are real, and we have to work hard to overcome them. As a woman, I have faced many of them. Uh, but what I want to emphasize is that as we mentor the girls and the women, it's very, very important that we emphasize the issue of hard work and um, the issue of not entertaining mediocrity. Because some girls may take it for granted that because they are girls and we are mentoring and pushing for the female agenda, they will sail through. There is no shortcut. They have to work hard. They have to be excellent at what they do. 
and we have to preach that message to be as competitive as the boys. Thank you very much. Last, uh, last comment over there? Okay. That will be the last one, and then I'll give the floor to my colleagues. Okay, thank you very much. Answers. Possibly, I'm not good at articulating gender issues. I think sometimes I know we talk about gender issues, but sometimes it gets a bit because I, I call sitting in a private university in Kenya, which takes the cream of the country. Strangely, for the last 10, 11 years at the graduation ceremonies, there are 10 awards. For the last 10 years, the boys only got one award, and that is on sports. <laughs> All the nine excellent awards goes to the ladies, and that is worrying us that where are the ladies going to get their husbands in the African context? So I think there's, we also need to look at that. But I think one of the things that possibly I wanted to bring up is, which is what we need to look at is how EDCTP3 is coming in. I'm still not seeing money from the African government on the table. This should be the next 20 years. How are we going to make this work? And I think it might start with those of us who have gray hair in Africa. Can we start providing grants locally? I challenged a few of my pediatrician colleagues in Kenya. And from next year, through our center, which is created Stratham University, we are going to start funding nominally three awards for young pediatricians. And we hope to build them possibly. It's starting at around a very modest figure of around we are going to start off with $10,000, but we want to build this every year because we are not going to, be, to convince the Kenyan rich boys to put their money in research if those of us who are working there are not putting the money. And that is my challenge to my colleagues, the boys of my age in Africa. Can we get the African money on the table? And the ball starts with us. Let's not look from out Let's start from within. And if by 20 years we can show that, that we can get money from Africa, I think that's when we will be moving towards scientific independence. And the time is now. OK, um, last comment or question. Thank you very much. It's more of a comment. My name is Ene Ipokri. I'm originally from Nigeria, but I work at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So late last year, in partnership with the TDR Global, WHO TDR Global, we put together a practical guide on mentorship. This is looking at institutionalizing research mentorship in low and middle income countries. And we're trying to field test that guide now. And we found some areas are lacking, particularly in supporting young female researchers to reach their goal. So we're coming in from the place of mentorship. How can we provide mentorship for these young female early career researchers to carry on <coughs> with the, their careers and sort of advance to the peak? So that is what we are trying to do now. And it's very interesting to hear from Derry and um, Jessica sharing their experiences. A lot of all what they've shared also came up in a scoping review we are doing. So it'd be interesting to speak to you guys later. Probably we can capture a case study as part of the okay. version 2.0 of the practical guide. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, there's the last one there. <laughs> oh, this will be the last one, so don't worry. My sincere apologies. My name is Christine Navidio, and um, I, I work for PATH. And when I don't work for PATH, I'm at EDCTP as the vice chair of the stakeholders forum. That's why I'm here. And uh, I come here to speak and, and, and uh, share my experience. Exactly 18 years ago, I was mentored by one Dr. Alex Cotino. And, that's, and I've become who I've become because of Dr. Alex. And when I was in the stakeholders forum yesterday and we were discussing capacity development, I said, I owe Alex. And today I set up a WhatsApp group of three young female scientists and three young male scientists. 
and I didn't need EDCTP money to do that. And there's a lot that we can do back home without EDCTP. And already I've talked to them. I was talking to Laurent, Laurent, Michel, and uh, of the Hera, and I sent them that picture. And I asked them, this is your one hour lunch break. Can you tell me what you're learning from this WhatsApp group from since morning to now? I'd like to speak to my brothers and sisters from Africa. There's a lot we can do. Thank you. So, um, Rela, could you start summarizing our session, if you agree with me, and then I'll pass to... Thank you, Exevio Atina. She wants to empower the women <laughs> in the research. Thank you for all of you for coming and listening to us. Thank you for offering to contributing to this discussion. I think this capacity building symposium has provided valuable insight into the evolution of the partner and capacity development that are the heir of the EDCTP mission. It is also give off a novel view into a future we can all contribute to. Maybe this is a word that I can just give share to you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Jocelyn. <laughs> Goma. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Sorry, I didn't get it. Do you want me to say something? Goma, yes, summarizing your <coughs> view after all those comments. Okay, um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to have uh, some last words. Uh, I think uh, I was emotional as well when uh, my young colleagues uh, mentioned these uh, issues with uh, empowering uh, women. Uh, but on one side, I would say let's uh, celebrate our success because uh, we do have very good uh, examples. I've been looking in the room. I didn't count really, but I can just see that there are a lot of women. This is already... Despite all the challenges that uh, you are facing, uh, you are there. So this is uh, to congratulate all the women uh, involved in science and beyond uh, the men who allow all the women to be involved at every level you are. And uh, yeah, this is everything that I can say. Uh, I have to say as well and to admit uh, what uh, was in my talk, uh, about the opportunities that are given by consortia like uh, Pam Africa and uh, Sindofo. This is what I say, let's uh, celebrate our success as well. This is what allowed us to uh, uh, listen from uh, uh, our young uh, colleagues here. Uh, congratulations to them because uh, it was not granted. It's not as if we've given them favors. No, uh, they had as well their own uh, predispositions and uh, this is why they came and they are at the positions uh, where they are. So uh, for us uh, working uh, besides them, we are very proud. Uh, that was not intentionally, but we are very happy to be then part of the mentors of these uh, young ladies. I take as well the point of uh, burnout. Uh, I hope we won't be uh, discussing gender balance in the future, like having the men uh, uh, kind of a discrimination for, for men. I hope we will all have uh, a good uh, emotional, uh, let's say, intelligence uh, that everything will be going in a good way, that there is no one left behind. This is everything that I can say. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Jessica, and is there any last comment? Uh, just to say thank you. And uh, of course, more need is need to be done. This is like 0.1% of what we need to do. And I would also like to thank you all the female researchers here and congratulate them for the such great job they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank all those that came before us and made it easier for us to be here. So thank you. And what would work for us from now till when we get where we are, when we are lacking in motivation, keep working. Never let go. Thank you. So uh, this has been a very useful session and uh, very typical. 
So we want to thank Professor Charles for reserving time. He was, I mean, at the beginning when we planned this session, we thought that he could make it to come here in person, but it was not possible. So uh, even though he, we managed to have his record, so we want to thank him. Second, EDCP for allowing us to have this session. The Zindofo and Pan-African project managers and teams, so thank you very much for uh, organizing all this session. Uh, our colleagues in communication, uh, they went through all this process on record and so on, so thank you very much. Uh, then there was uh, different messages. Um, clearly, capacity building is not just a building, it's not just equipment, it has to deal with the people, and people have feeling, people have families behind them, uh, being them junior or senior, they are, they are, yeah, socially they need to be also considered and taken account. Second, it need investment. There's an area that probably we as a project we cannot solve. We need um, political involvement. So some of the aspects that were mentioned this, this, in this session uh, depend in some, in some way how the country is organized politically, how the rules are. I remember in my country, men has just one day for maternity when you have a child. <laughs> and then I think we passed to two days or one week and mother has two months. So it's always a challenge for men. It's not just uh, women who is facing that. So I think all of us were invited to you know, think on that. And mental health became the table. It's a very important area that we marginalize and uh, probably we, we are done putting it in, the, in our front. So we're invited to, to go through it. This will not be the last moment we, we discuss this topic, so this is just a starting point. I'm glad to see that there are people who are colleagues who are interested to take this ahead. So thank you very much for your patience, for your time. So we hope that the next forum will come up with very exciting numbers and probably progress. Thank you very much and have a good day.